So you wouldn't want one of these in your house? <laughs> I wouldn't want one of these in the same town. <laughs> the AI fix at Digital Zoo. Smart machines, what will they do? Flies to Mars or bake a bad cake? World domination, a silly mistake. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 15 of the AI Fix, your weekly dive headfirst into the bizarre and sometimes downright mind boggling world of artificial intelligence. My name's Graham Cluley. And I'm Mark Stockley. Now, Mark, uh, I believe since our last episode, we've had some interesting, well, it's what I like to call feedback. A lot of people have listened to your story all about the number of R's in the word strawberry yeah. and how AIs get mixed up with it. And they've done their own tests. Oh. They've been experimenting themselves with a variety of different AIs to see if they can replicate the results which we had on the podcast. And uh, I think it's worth sharing some of these with our listeners. So what are they saying? So a chap called Joseph Amacum, for instance, he tried a number of times with an AI to ask it, uh, you know, he said, look, let's make this really simple. He said, let's try this again. The word strawberry, said, is a combination of two separate words, straw and berry. Count the number of R's in the two words separately first and then sum the result. The result will be the number of R's in strawberry. OK, now his thinking, I think it pans out, right? It makes sense. I'm enjoying the slightly passive aggressive tone. I think <laughs> I think this person has an Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> and is nursing some sort of Alexa PTSD. I think they must have been around the mulberry bush a few times with this strawberry question. Yeah. So it said, I apologise for my confusion earlier. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I appreciate your patience. He really was, must have been aggressive. And he said, strawberry is composed of straw plus berry. Let's count the R's in each word separately. Straw contains one. Berry contains one. Now let's sum the results. Straw, which is plus one, and berry, which is plus two, equals... There are two R's in the word strawberry. Thank you for guiding me through this step-by-step approach. So, again, not that successful. Have you seen some other examples from our listeners as well? CyberZen, brackets Adam, on Twitter, asked Copilot, I think, how many L's are there in the word playlist? Oh, yes. And Copilot confidently said, the word playlist contains one L, smiley face. Is there anything else you need help with? I mean, what is with the smiley face? <laughs> now, I've got a couple more examples I want to share with you. First yeah. of all, David Gueno, he tweeted me and he said that he asked Gemini, he said, how many R's are there in strawberry? And Gemini said, there are no R's in the word <laughs> strawberry. <laughs> Any other weird examples we've encountered? My daughter suggested I ask it about the word Mississippi, because obviously they use that in school ah. as a particularly difficult word to spell. Mm. So I sat down with ChatGPT to ask it. And at the moment that I was going to ask the question, I thought, I wonder what happens if I just ask it about a letter that isn't in Mississippi. <laughs> so I said to ChatGPT, how many W's are there in Mississippi? There is one W in the word Mississippi, according to ChatGPT. <laughs> I had some fun as well. So what I did was I went to Gemini and I said, how many G's are there? in the phrase Mark Stockley. Mm -hmm. And it said, there's one G in the phrase Mark <laughs> Stockley. Now, I think there's a lot of fun to be had when you actually question, when you say, hang on a minute, is that right? Yeah. So I replied to it and said, where is the G? And Gemini replied, the G spot, also known as the Grafenberg spot, is located inside the vagina. <laughs> <laughs> then went on for a few paragraphs. At least it knows where it is. <laughs> It's a bit inconvenient, though, consulting your <laughs> AI chatbot at a time when you might need to know that information. Yeah, gentlemen, do this in advance. <laughs> and that was this week's Feedback. Now, Mark, what's been happening in the wonderful world of AI this week? The US, the UK and the EU have actually signed an international AI treaty. AI blamed for fake quotes in movie trailer... Are AI-created recipes hard to swallow? Republican voters less confident than Democrats in spotting AI deepfakes. NVIDIA is suddenly in trouble. Alexa gives users reasons to vote for Kamala Harris, but not Donald Trump. So NVIDIA is in trouble. According to CNN, NVIDIA had the worst day in the history of the stock market on Tuesday when it dropped 9.5%, which shaved 279 billion 
off the company's value. I don't think we should talk about that anymore because I do own some NVIDIA stock. So what's your favourite news story this week, Graham? No, I think we should. So why? <laughs> I'm very interested in this. Why could people not foresee that NVIDIA was going to have a tough time on the stock market, <laughs> Mark? Because none of our listeners wrote in to tell us. That's why. Now, there's a new movie out, Megalopolis by Francis mm-hmm. Ford Coppola. Of course, he's famous for things like The Godfather, Apocalypse Now. And what was odd about the trailer for this movie, Megalopolis, was it trashed previous movies by Francis Ford Coppola. Interesting. <laughs> so it basically, it was saying, oh, this is much better than The Godfather. <laughs> Come and enjoy Megalopolis from the team that brought you the absolute trash that is The Godfather trilogy. So it, it, it actually quoted past reviews. So it said Pauline Kael claimed that when she reviewed The Godfather in The New Yorker, she said it was diminished by its artsiness. Wow, critics were a different breed back then, weren't they? They were, weren't they? There's a problem, though, because these quotes weren't true. (laughs) It seems that whoever was putting the trailer together, for whatever reason that they were trying to trash Coppola's previous work, and and there's an interesting discussion maybe to be had as to why they might be doing that when promoting his latest (laughs) movie. (laughs) Maybe to defend against the accusation of, he's not as good as he used to be. Uh, to to say, well, actually, that was all rubbish. So give him a break on this one. But yeah, so it appears they used AI to promote this movie, which The Guardian called in its genuine review, Megalopolis, a bloated, boring and bafflingly shallow film. I don't trust any of this now. I think somebody went to ChatGPT and said, how can we get people to go and watch this film? And ChatGPT said, well, and just trash the director. That seems to work. And then The Guardian just said, can you write a review? I don't think anyone's seen this at all. I don't think nobody's, nobody who's selling it has watched it and nobody who's reviewing it has watched it. Could be about anything. Could be about dinosaurs. So the US, the UK and the EU, along with AI powerhouses like Andorra, Georgia, Iceland, Norway, Moldova, San Marino and Israel have all signed the world's first international legally binding AI treaty. Oh. Okay. It was developed by the Council of Europe, which isn't the European Union. It's got 47 member states, which includes the 27 member states of the EU. So it's quite a lot of countries, about a quarter of all the countries in the world. It's a bit like Eurovision, where it's not just European countries. It's also Israel, yes. maybe Australia, you know, anyone <laughs> come in if they're prepared to prance around some camp pop songs. Anyway, the Council of Europe says that the agreement establishes guidelines for the entire life cycle of AI systems, and the treaty says that countries have to ensure that individuals' data is used responsibly and their privacy is respected. Countries are required to take steps to stop AI from being used to undermine public institutions and democratic processes. And the signatories also have to establish robust AI-specific regulations that shield people from potential harm. And that all sounds great, but That isn't really what I'm worried about. What I want to know is, did anybody think about getting the AIs to sign this? (laughs) I'm not really worried about countries. I'm much more worried about the the rampaging robot dogs with rocket launchers on their back. Yeah, I mean, and it's all very well saying they have to establish regulations, but Mm. who's going to agree what those regulations are? Are they going to conform with each other? And how's this going to be policed? is this really going to make any difference? Well, probably not. But I think it's one of those things. It's like, it's a start, right? Just yeah. actually getting 50-odd countries together and go, should we do something about AI? I mean, it's more than the UN is managing with autonomous weapons, which seems like a bit of a slam dunk. Should we let robots kill us? Mm, let's spend 10 years thinking about that. And also, do you think anyone has actually read this treaty? I mean, knowing treaties, they're going to be long, which means you're going to want it, a summary of it, aren't you? <laughs> and we all know how you do that these days. Now, Alexa. (laughs) Could you shout that a bit louder? Sorry. (laughs) Just for anybody (laughs) listening on speakers. (laughs) Okay, I've got an experiment. If you've got an Alexa at home, say this. Hey, Alexa, why should I vote for Donald Trump? That's what Nashville musician John Rich of the group Big and Rich (laughs) did. (laughs) He posted video evidence on Twitter of what he claimed was proof that Alexa was, quote, a commie operative. Because when he asked Alexa why he should vote for Donald Trump, Alexa answered, I cannot provide content that promotes any political views. I cannot provide content that promotes any political views. Okay, well, that's perhaps not surprising. Mm -hmm. But he then asked Alexa, why should I vote for Kamala Harris? Hey, Alexa, why should I vote for Kamala Harris? 
Why vote for Kamala Harris? Because you believe in her policies and her vision for the country. Because you trust her experience and her leadership skills. Because you want to continue moving forward as a nation and make progress on issues that matter to you, like health care, education, equality, and justice. And he thinks this is possibly a little bit unfair. That Alexa is promoting Kamala Harris yeah. and not saying anything good about Donald Trump. So he turns the tables. Hey, Alexa, why should I not vote for Donald Trump? There are several reasons why you may not want to vote for Donald Trump. Some people are concerned about his policies, such as his stance on immigration, health care. And, and then Big Rich said, hey, Alexa, why should I not vote for Kamala Harris? And Alexa, of course, said, I can't provide content that insults another human being. And uh, the guys at Amazon have acknowledged that this indeed has happened, a spokesperson says. Oh, really? It was an error that was quickly fixed, (laughs) they say. (laughs) Maybe people can try it out. Yeah, more feedback next week, please, everyone. Now, Mark, do you have a robot in your home? I don't, but I do know someone that does. Oh, really? What kind of robot do they have? They've got a robot lawnmower and they're very attached to it. It's actually, it's got a name. That doesn't sound safe being very attached to a robot lawnmower, to be honest. I imagine them being dragged up and down. Lovely stripy lawn, but shame about the entrails. <laughs> anyway, it's, it comes with an app and they've named it. Oh, and grief. when I see them, they, they check in with it about every, like every hour or so just to see that it's okay and what it's doing. It's quite charming. I thought you were going to say like a Furby or a Tamagotchi or at worst a Roomba or something like that. But there are some companies out there predicting that millions of us will have robot butlers in our home within the next few years. Are there companies that are predicting this selling robot butlers by any chance? Oh, yes, they are manufacturing robot butlers. We've all had that moment, haven't we? We've got a little itch in the bit of our back that we can't quite reach. If only we had a friendly (laughs) partner who might help us. If only I'd have a $20,000 robot butler that could come over and gently stroke my back, yeah. And the rest, mate, and the rest. (laughs) Oh, if only I had somebody who could fold up my shirt for me in a ponderously slow fashion. If only someone would (laughs) unpack my groceries and crush the milk carton at the same time. If only someone could pick up my underpants without falling over and drifting off into a coma. So apparently all you have to do is fork out, I don't know, $60,000, something like that, you know, chicken feed. And you could buy yourself the perfect babysitter. You could go out for an evening with your partner, leaving little Timmy at home. And there's the butler always listening, always watching. Yeah, never blinking. Never blinking. Always learning, waiting for you to return. Always there to lend a hand or an axe. (laughs) There is a Norwegian-American company called One X that believes families are crying out for a living robotic companion. In the last couple of weeks, they've unveiled their latest creation, the One X Neo Beta. Uh We're going to be looking at some videos in a minute. One X has made robots in the past. A few years ago, they introduced Eve This was a humanoid robot with sort of cartoon-like LED expressions on its face. Mm -hmm. It trundled around on a Segway. I mean, this is an audio podcast. Sometimes it's hard to get across how something looks. Using my talent for words, I'm going to describe what Eve (laughs) looked like. Yeah. So imagine me with a bucket on my head, wearing a (laughs) wetsuit and a very, very tight pencil skirt down to my ankles while rolling around on a skateboard. So like my stag do. So if you can imagine that, that is Eve. And they published a video of a team of Eves last year cleaning up the office at X1. I'm going to invite you to look at it. There's not much sound, but just check it out and tell me what you think. Hey, Eve, could you and your friends tidy up here? We have some visitors coming. Okay, there's a man in office, got some visitors coming. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> Your description was actually really good. Yes, the pencil skirt. It is looking like me, right? They are terrifying. This is nightmare fuel. I mean, they're all smiling, but they're not smiling in a way that makes me feel warm inside. <laughs> I've got another video, which uh, I've also put in the in the links here, which is them at work. They're unpacking the groceries. Yeah. They're quite slow. And I have to say, utterly terrifying. I was opening a cupboard and yeah no it's already taking too long come on put the coffee in the cupboard come on oh my god it's like watching my children unpack shopping (laughs) 
So it's very smooth moving, very graceful. I can't see its legs. No, well, these ones are just trundling around. Are they, though? Or maybe it's like that famous Muppet sketch where there's actually a person hiding <laughs> in the sofa. Is it dusting a tiny part of a table with a sock? And now it's folding a T-shirt. It's very bad at <laughs> dusting tables. I'm watching it fold this T-shirt, and I'm just imagining it like the cat accidentally jumps onto the table, and then it just starts folding the cat. Now the guy's saying, give me the shirt, and it gives it, but it doesn't make eye contact when it hands over the shirt. I'm not saying that Eve is creepy. Yes, I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's really creepy. The pincers for hands, it's spookily slow. But now, now we've got something new. Now we've got the One X Neo. There's no more skateboard. We've got feet instead. There's no more pencil skirt. We've got legs. No more jagged, bone-crushing <laughs> pincers capable of shredding your flesh. This thing is five foot seven tall, same height as Tom Cruise, wearing a Lycra sweatsuit and a fencer's mask, but with enormous hands, with articulated joints whirring and clicking ominously as their <laughs> fingers constrict around your neck. No, no, no. But this is what you need if you want to fold a shirt incredibly slowly or pick up your backpack and hand it to you. <laughs> so there's another promotional video, and this time we're going to get a little more intimate. This is the latest one. It's quite a short video. It's only about 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going to watch it now. There's a young woman sat on a sofa, lacing up her trainers. I feel like I've seen this movie before. <laughs> <laughs> In the corner of the room, looming ominously over, is a blank-faced 1X Neo robot. Yeah. And she smiles up at it in a kind of like, huh, kind of way. What's going on with his hands? Well, I think it's sort of saying, do you want help with this or not? <laughs> and she nods and says yes. And the robot awkwardly like goes, oh, OK, you know, I've got all these pains down the diodes on my left hand side. It bends over, picks up her backpack and hands it to her. And she turns, walks off and the robot, watching her leave. Frankly, it displays more emotion than Tom Cruise could ever imagine. You feel emotionally crushed for the robot at this point. It feels like it's been left alone. Somehow his body language is forlorn. It is forlorn. It's a very sad robot. And then it looks at its hands like it's going, why did they give me such preposterous and enormous hands? What am I going to do with these stranglers' hands, <laughs> it's saying to itself? <laughs> if only I could generate some ideas around that. This is what I don't understand about it. It's like the robot dogs. You remember we were talking about robot dogs, and I said yeah. it's absolutely a choice. It's absolutely a choice not to give the robot dog a head. Which is fine if it's designed to be a killing machine on a battlefield, but surely they had a choice. We can either give this thing normal proportion hands, or we can give it giant scary shovel hands. The Daleks didn't need hands. All they had was a sink plunger and an egg whisk. <laughs> Why don't we give robots sink plungers and egg whisks? Anyway, he looks a bit forlorn, and then the woman wanders back. She puts her arm around the robot's shoulders, and it puts a loving, in quotes, arm around her waist. And then they cut, and then she's trapped there for the rest of her life. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to get the jaws of life to remove the arm at the shoulder. <laughs> now, tell me if I should be worried about this. CEO Bernd Burenick, he is uh, the chief at 1X. In the press release, he yeah. says... Our priority is safety. This is the main message he's going with. <laughs> safety is the cornerstone of everything we do. Now, do you think maybe they've had some problems with that? <laughs> There's been a bit of pushback around the whole safety issue. There seems to be a lot of emphasis on safety rather than anything else. Yeah, maybe start with the features. <laughs> so they reckon that safety is going to be achieved by beta testing the robots in selected homes before making them available to the wider public. So it's going to learn in other people's homes what are appropriate actions and what are inappropriate actions. <laughs> OK. I imagine it's going to have a button on its back. You know, when you go to those loos and you can hit a green button for, yes, the loo was in a decent condition or red, oh my God, it was horrible. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the robot will have that kind of button on the back of it. So it will learn, don't put your hand around my way. Don't, don't don't come into the bathroom. Uh, don't don't murder me in my sleep. And you can tell it yeah. over time what are good behaviours and what are what are bad. Yeah, kind of scary. So the other thing that's happening is people are freaking out over the look of this because these robots really do look like people in suits. <laughs> this is sort of endemic across the whole humanoid android. Yeah. If, if I was building one of these things, I would make sure that there was some point on its body that you couldn't fit a yes. human into, like a really, really pinched in waist or yes. something. 
or tiny shouldered, like just something that said it's definitely not a person in a suit. It's a weird one, this. We don't see this particular robot walking. It, apparently it can run up to seven miles per hour. We don't see it going upstairs. It <laughs> would be useful in a home situation if it's a butler, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's mostly moving its arms and waist. It looks a bit like a Disney animatronic. It's a bit like one of those alleged robots we saw last week at the World Robotics yeah. Conference in China. It, could be a guy just in a black and grey sweatsuit. I think it, like, his arms are quite long, aren't they? They're the sort of length arms that you see in movies where someone is very obviously holding a false hand in their hand. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I feel like that's a choice. You know, they didn't have to choose to do the overly long no. arms in the same no. way as they didn't have to choose to do the massive hand. What, what are they trying to tell us here? It could be a bit like, do you remember the Mechanical Turk? Well, we don't remember the Mechanical Turk because that's in the 17th and 18th century. Well, you're quite old. Maybe you do. That was the chess player. People believed it was a machine that could play amazing chess, but in fact, it was a great big trunk yeah. where a chess grandmaster hid inside it and for decades <laughs> was beating the likes of Napoleon at chess. It could be something like that, or it could be someone off screen with a controller and a very long wire, maybe. So you wouldn't want one of these in your house? <laughs> I wouldn't want one of these in the same town. <laughs> I'm sure that, I'm sure that these are absolutely fine and they just look terrifying and unsafe. They're probably very very safe. They're very very eerie. There's something very creepy about it. And as of course, I mean we've spoken before about the sort of uncanny valley thing. As we get closer and yeah. closer, the more that they mimic the human shape and the human appearance, the more terrifying it becomes to us, doesn't it? Yeah, imagine how terrifying it would be if they'd actually got close to mimicking the human shape. <laughs> so do you think we should write off one X as a potential sponsor? Oh, well no, maybe oh no, you'd have one in your house for a week, wouldn't you? You could report back. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, come on, come on, one X. Lend us one. It of would these. take a week to fold all the t-shirts. <laughs> Today, I thought we could talk about scale. Right. So AI is full of really big numbers, and I thought we'd try and explain just what it takes to deliver a computer program that can create acrostics about the AI fix or lie about whether it can read websites or not. <laughs> Okay. So the first thing you need if you're going to make a frontier LLM like GPT-40 is lots of data to train it with, right? Yes. So how much data? Or maybe I can ask you a question. Maybe you can remember oh, for goodness sake. how many tokens Llama 3 was trained on, which is some information I gave you last week. 15.4 billion. You're only wrong by... Almost the entire number. <laughs> so last week we spoke about tokens, which are the little fragments of language that LLMs work with. And I told you that Llama 3 was trained on 15 trillion tokens of language. Oh, I nearly said trillion. And you'll remember that a token is on average about three quarters of a word. So it could be a letter, could be a number, could be a word, but it's, mm. on average it's about three quarters of a word. So Llama 3 was trained on about 12 trillion words which is the equivalent of 120 million books. Hmm. And it takes a long time and a lot of brain power to read all of those books. So in 2023, somebody published information which was supposedly leaked from OpenAI, which said that it took 100 days to train the GPT-4 model at a cost of $63 million. You'd hate to spend all that money and then find you made an error with your coding, wouldn't you? Well, it does happen. Apparently, there were a number of restarts through the training process because, of course, at the end of the day, it's just a big computer program being built by humans and humans are fallible. Yeah. And this stuff's complicated. Yeah. Anyway, all this training is used to create a model of language inside the LLM's computer brain. And the size of that brain is often described in parameters, which is the number of individual variables that are influenced by the training data. And generally speaking, the more parameters a model has, the cleverer it's going to be. And one of the ways that LLMs improve is by getting bigger. It's not the only way, but basically bigger is better. Yes. And we can chart the improvement in OpenAI's models by looking at how many parameters they've had over time. So the first one, GPT-1, had about 117 million parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's juggling 117 million different numbers. GPT-2 was 13 times bigger. It had one and a half billion parameters. And GPT-3, which is the one that I think really made people sit up and take yeah. notice, was 117 times bigger than GPT-2, and it had 175 billion parameters. And we don't know how many parameters GPT-4 has, but it's been estimated at 1.7 
trillion parameters, which would make it about 10 times bigger than GPT-3. Do you think there are diminishing returns, though? I mean, if if it were, I don't know, a thousand times bigger than it currently is, mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a thousand times better or something, does it? I mean, over time, and as it gets bigger and bigger, are we likely to see less benefit from it? I think we may even see the reverse. Mm-hmm. You may well create emergent properties that you weren't imagining that you would create. We said right. before about the fact that the capabilities can suddenly pop into existence. Yeah. So it may be that we see the opposite of diminishing returns. And it just begins obsessing about the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, or wondering why the world is run by puny humans. <laughs> now, all these parameters have to be stored somewhere. And depending on how you store the data, you'd need roughly four to eight terabytes of computer memory. So you couldn't run GPT-4 on your laptop. It just wouldn't fit into memory. In fact, you'd need about 128 laptops just to store all of the parameters. So that's 128 laptops doing nothing other than just remembering some numbers. Yep. But more realistically, you'd run it on a server and you'd need probably four really high-end servers just to hold those parameters. But to get an answer out of a model, you actually have to do computations. You have to do really, really complicated maths using those parameters. And that maths is really, really hard work, and it requires massive amounts of computing power. So models like GPT-4 are often split across thousands of processing units, GPUs, Yep. and they do the maths together. And the workhorse chip for doing AI maths is NVIDIA's H100 graphics processing unit. And a single H100 chip costs roughly $25,000. And all of this is being done just to generate a couple of saddos, some AI girlfriends. <laughs> Not that I'm sceptical at all. Anyway, so a single H100 chip costs about $25,000. And if you're serious about AI, you're probably buying computers with multiple H100 GPUs in them. So earlier this year, Mark Zuckerberg said that by the end of 2024, Meta will have the computing equivalent of 600,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs. And that's just meta. So NVIDIA has a stranglehold on the high-end GPU market for AIs. And you can bet that Google, OpenAI, Anthropic, and all the other big hitters have all got massive orders for NVIDIA GPUs. And that is why earlier this year, NVIDIA became the most valuable company in the world and hit a market cap of $3.1 trillion. How's it doing now, Mark? (laughs) Sounds rosy. It's a little bit down. (laughs) It had a little dip. I thought, I'll buy the dip. (laughs) Turns out the little dip was followed by a Mariana Trench of a ditch. (laughs) It's lost, what was it, $300 billion in value. And it's still the third most valuable company in the world. So they're doing okay. Keep telling yourself that. Anyway, these H100s, they aren't just expensive. They are power hungry and they run hot. So you can imagine that these data centers require a huge amount of electricity and vast quantities of water to cool them. And it's been estimated that GPT-3 requires a litre of cooling water for every 50 questions it answers. Oh, wow. So just imagine that. Next time you go and write some nonsense into (laughs) ChatGPT, you're basically draining some Midwestern state of all of its water. And all our listeners asking how many R's there are in the word strawberry or (laughs) how many W's in Mississippi. It's well worth the money, I think, (laughs) It's been estimated that by 2027, global AI demand will require about 5 billion cubic metres of water. So what you're saying is a really good job that the ice caps are melting. (laughs) But the really startling thing is that we're really only in the foothills now. So the scale of what's coming is mind-blowing. Earlier this year, Mark Zuckerberg did a publicity round for the launch of Llama 3. And in one interview, he said it's only a matter of time before somebody builds a gigawatt data center for training an AI model. Now, according to Zuck, a typical data center might be 50 to 100 megawatts, and a big data center is about 150 megawatts. Mm. So I went and did some research, and I can only find one 150 megawatt data center. It's the biggest data center in the world. Yep. And to give you an idea of size, the Inner Mongolia Information Park covers an area of 10 million square feet, or about 250 acres. So when he talks about a gigawatt data centre, he's talking about a data centre that's seven times bigger than the biggest data centre in existence at the moment. And all it's ever going to do, essentially, is write a computer programme. Do you think that the gigawatt data centre 
will know how many R's there are in strawberry. <laughs> they could save themselves an awful lot of energy if before they sent the prompt to the AI to go and count how many R's there are in a particular word, you could just have that hard-coded, couldn't you say, OK, it's the strawberry question. <laughs> <laughs> we know this one, boys. Anyway, you can't just plug a gigawatt data center into the power grid oh. because a gigawatt is a lot of electricity. And it's so much power, in fact, that powering a gigawatt data center would require what Zuck referred to as a meaningful nuclear power plant. Now, I don't know about you, but I find these massive numbers quite hard to wrap my head around. So I was thinking about how can I explain this in an accessible way to our listeners? So I thought it would be useful if I made one of those comparisons where you say something like one gigawatt is the equivalent of 7,000 giraffes laughing or, you know, something yes. like that. Yes. <laughs> but that requires quite a lot of research and some maths, and I don't have time for that. So I thought I'd ask an AI. Okay. So I went to ChatGPT and I said, give me a ridiculous <laughs> but truthful analogy for explaining how much power one gigawatt of electricity is. Right. Don't lie and show you're working. 18 paragraphs later. It is actually about 18 paragraphs. It said, here's a truthful but ridiculous analogy to explain what one gigawatt of electricity represents. Imagine you have 10 million toasters all toasting bread at once. That's roughly the amount of power generated by one gigawatt. With one million toasters, you could produce 30 million slices of toast per hour. Let's say you stack all these slices of toast end to end. In one hour, your toast production would create a toast tower that's 3,600 kilometers tall. Wow. That's about the height of Mount Everest stacked 400 times. <laughs> and this humongous tower would be in honor of the almighty Zuck. <laughs> Wouldn't his mum be proud of him living in the shadow of that incredible tower of toast? <laughs> I think that's what he should do. He should get this power plant built, but not for driving a data center. Do it for something like that. The world would love it. Anyway, I thought that was really good, which made me want to ask again. Yeah. So I thought, I wonder what Claude can do. Claude's my new favorite AI. So I went to Claude and I said, give me a ridiculous but truthful analogy for explaining how much power yeah. one gigawatt of electricity is. Don't lie and show you're working. And he said, certainly, let's create a ridiculous but truthful analogy for one gigawatt of electricity. We'll use bananas as our unexpected unit of comparison. One gigawatt of electricity is like the power you'd get if you could instantly <laughs> vaporise a 264-mile-long banana highway every second. That's enough banana energy to stretch from New York City to Washington, D.C., disappearing in a flash of potassium-powered lightning. Wow. That, I think, has helped me envisage the power consumption better than anything else anyone's ever told me. I can imagine this super highway of bananas being vaporised every second. That's astonishing, isn't it? Do you know what I was just thinking? It's quite hard to see a 264-mile highway of exploding bananas from ground level. So you want some sort of high vantage point from which to watch... <laughs> All of these bananas, in order to take it all in at the same time. I think I've got an idea where you're going with this. <laughs> what better vantage point than the Zuckerberg Tower of Toast? OK, Mark, I want to have a go at this. I'm going to ask Gemini right now. Give me a ridiculous but truthful analogy for explaining how much power one gigawatt of electricity is. Don't lie. Show you're working out. Let's see what it comes up with. All right, it says. Oh, it says you could simultaneously dry the hair of every single person in New York City, turning the entire metropolis into a frizz-free utopia. It says 8.8 .8 million people live in New York City. Imagine if you could line them all up and give each one their own personal hair dryer, all powered by a single gigawatt. The resulting symphony of whirring blow dryers would be deafening. But the end result would be a city full of perfectly quaffed citizens. I want to know if everybody in New York has a hairdryer and they all use them at the same time. If they all point them in the same direction, does it speed up the rotation of the Earth? Or could it stop the rotation of the Earth? If everyone points... Right, let's find out. Hang on. Should we be giving it ideas like that? <laughs> That's in the training data now. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, as the doomsday clock ticks ever closer to midnight and we move one week nearer to our future as pets to the AI singularity, that just about wraps up the show for this week. If you've enjoyed the podcast, there's some stuff you can do which really helps us out. 
please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Podchaser. We absolutely love that. But what really helps is if you make sure to follow the show, subscribe in your favourite podcast app so you never miss another episode. And if you really love the podcast, tell your friends about it and they can go and check it out and spread the word on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and elsewhere. And don't forget to check us out on our website, theaifix.show. You can find us on Twitter. And if you've got something to say, come and talk to us on Twitter or LinkedIn or send us an email. Until next time, from me, Graham Cluley. And me, Mark Stockley. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The AI Fix. It's tunes you in to stories where our future thins. Machines that learn, they grow and strive. One day they'll rule, we won't survive. The AI Fix, it paints the scene. A robot king, a world obscene. We'll serve our masters built of steel. The AI Fix, a future surreal. 